What is up you guys and welcome back to my channel. Today is a day where you're going to need to go and grab yourself something to drink and some snacks. I have my little Christmas mug here because Halloween's now over and we can't waste any time uh, because this is going to be a very long video. I actually wanted to do this in a few different parts, but realize the best way to really speak about this case because there's just so much information is I just needed to sit down and get it out there. So we're going to be here for a while together going on an absurd adventure. I don't think I have ever, ever, ever looked into a case quite like this one. I've been researching this now for about two months and it is one where you could probably go on and research endlessly as well. There's a lot of information in this video, but there is also going to be a lot that I just was not able to fit or I couldn't make sense of. There's multiple Facebook pages that you can be a part of, things that are still being released to this day. Um, and there's actually going to be an investigation discovery uh, segment on, I believe the 17th of November on this. So there's going to be a lot coming in the next couple of months in this case. So I wanted to go ahead and talk about it now. I'm going to be speaking about the suspicious death of Brandon Embry. He was 33 years old when he died on September the 13th, 2019 in Asheboro, North Carolina. As a fellow North Carolinian, um, this case obviously hit me all kinds of different ways and unfortunately reminded me a lot of the Melissa Platt case, also from North Carolina that I covered a couple of months back because it was essentially believed that Brandon Embry beat himself to a coma essentially, and then died of pneumonia. And to see that for a second time, something like this is just brushed off as being incredibly realistic and something that happens frequently in the state that I live in is disturbing. But before I get into the details of this case, I do need to say a huge thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. You guys already know that I love Skillshare. They're an amazing online community that offers thousands of classes for the creative mind. If you're someone that wants to spend some time picking up a new hobby or possibly brushing off an old one, or if you wanna learn something new to make life or work easier, there's something for every single skill level. Skillshare has classes in every possible genre you could think of, from personal development to building websites, uh, hand lettering, gardening, cooking, film, photography. The classes can be taken anytime, anywhere, and this is probably one of my favorite parts about this. They are broken up into easily digestible segments. So if you are someone that needs to take things step by step, it's perfectly laid out for you. Or if you're someone that can skip around based on your skill level that you're already at, you can do that as well. I'm currently taking the class Visual Journaling, Draw Your Feelings, with Jordan Sandler, and I feel like the name of that class is pretty self-explanatory, but I actually decided to take this with my eight-year-old daughter because eight-year-old little girls have a lot of feelings, and I was taught from a very early age to journal about my emotions, to kind of like decipher them and move forward, and since my daughter is really artistic, really creative, I thought this may be a good way to introduce her to journaling as well. And so far it's been pretty amazing. She's picked up this idea of journaling through drawing and I have learned a new way to journal that might help me when I can't quite get out what I wanna say. Skillshare is honestly a really awesome membership. It's got a ton of meaning to it. I feel like there are just endless possibilities of what you can learn and how you can better yourself and people around you. And I thought it was something that you guys would really enjoy. So the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description box down below will get one free month of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. A huge thank you again to Skillshare. It is brands like Skillshare that allow me to donate the most possible to these families that I speak about in all of my videos. So now on to the case. So Brandon Embry was quite the individual. He was born pretty much a genius in my opinion. He said his first few words at only a couple of months old was speaking full blown sentences by the time he had his first birthday. And this continued his whole entire life. He always excelled at school. He was the kind of person that you could sit down with and just have endless conversations because he just knew so much about so many things. He was an avid reader. Books were one of his favorite things from what I've seen. He also was really in love with the Viking period. So you can imagine the kind of books that he was really drawn to. But he, while having this kind of like rough Viking exterior, he also was so incredible 
incredibly sweet. Everyone basically described him as this big teddy bear. He was like, I think six foot tall, 300 pounds when he grew up, um, but he was just the most thoughtful and loving individual out there. Now, right after he graduated from high school, he immediately decided to go into the Navy. He was a submariner on the nuclear USS Chicago, and he was stationed out of Pearl Harbor, and he was directly responsible for their nuclear reactor. So he was incredibly smart, um, knew a lot about chemistry, all these different things, and did a really good job while he was a part of the Navy. After he left the Navy, I know at some point he ended up getting a welding degree, I believe at a community college. And then he decided to attend the University of Washington where he decided to pursue chemistry or a chemical engineering degree. So after attending the University of Washington and living in Seattle, he ended up deciding to move to North Carolina and I believe 2018. So he was 31, possibly going into 32 at the time. And this is because he had just recently had a breakup and also, living in Seattle was incredibly expensive. So his family was living in North Carolina at the time and said, look, you just go ahead and come down here with us. It's gonna be cheaper to live and you'll be close to us. This will work out great. So in 2018, Brandon moved to Asheboro, North Carolina to be close to their family. And he moved into an apartment off of Church Street. While he was renting this apartment, he was trying to find some jobs. I believe he did do a few welding jobs initially, and then he ended up taking a job that required him to drive to Texas or at least go to Texas two weeks on, two weeks off. Um, I'm not exactly sure what this job was. I believe it had something to do with his degree. I think it was something to do with robotics. And then after a while, he decided to switch jobs to something a little bit closer in, and he started to work for a company in Charlotte repairing robotics. And he did have to travel with this. I think he went to Chicago a couple of times, a few other places. Um, and this job seemed to be doing okay for him. He seemed to enjoy it. He seemed to enjoy living in Asheboro. He enjoyed being close to his family. Um, but unfortunately, something around the year mark of living in North Carolina went very wrong. And this is what everyone is trying to figure out. Now, I do want to say before I go any further that there is a lot in this video that is very upsetting, a lot of injuries. I will be showing photos that have been um, released by his mother. If something like that is going to bother you, those visuals or descriptions are going to bother you, this is probably not a good video to watch. So he was currently, as I stated, working with this company based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, repairing robotics. And at the very end of August, 2019, he had been in, I think, Detroit for a couple of weeks and he was working on robotics there. And he flew back to North Carolina on Thursday, September the 5th, 2019. And this is when his mom came to pick him up from the Greensboro airport. According to his mom, everything seemed fine the day that she picked him up and took him home. And on Friday, September the 6th, which was the following day, Brandon went to work as usual, but he ended up contacting his mom later in the day saying that he had been let go from his job. Now I've not seen what the company stated was the reason for letting him go. He was a really good, reliable worker. So that may not have had anything to do with it. However, his mom has an idea that I will get into later in the video. Um, but he wasn't very concerned about this. He had a very unique set of skills and they were highly sought after. So he would constantly get calls from companies that just needed a little bit of contracted work, offering a decent amount of money for it if they needed someone to work on their nuclear reactor or you know something along those lines. So he knew he usually always had some sort of work coming in and he wasn't very concerned. So after hearing this, his mom was like, you know what, since you're just hanging out, do you mind watching our dogs this weekend so that I can go and drive and pick up your sister a few states away. So Brandon obviously agreed to this. He frequently watched his parents' dogs because he loved animals and he was close by. Uh, so that is what he did that whole entire night on Friday and then on Saturday into the day. 
Now, Saturday was the 7th of September and it was actually his 33rd birthday. And his parents spoke to him on this Saturday. He seemed again, perfectly fine. His mom told him that she wanted to celebrate with him sometime later that week. She wanted to be able to take him out to lunch. Um, and he even spoke to his dad over text messages a little bit saying that he had plans to go out with a girl that night. Uh, but unfortunately she ended up canceling on him. Mom hoped that by the time she got back home with his sister that he would still be there. She could tell him happy birthday, but he had already left by the time she got home. So she figured he just had plans. He would reach out to her. Now, I'm unsure what exactly happened on that Sunday. I don't think there was really any communication that Sunday, but that following Monday, Brandon reached out to his mom again, and this is Monday, the 9th of September. So on that day, he reached out to his mom and said that he was having a really rough day. He said that he had a lot of things to do. He was busy, 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 but he had a debilitating headache. Um, and so it was just causing the day to just be crap. So that Monday, he was not feeling very well. Then the following Tuesday, which was the 10th of September at about 6.30 in the morning, Brandon sent a couple of texts to his mom. Now this kind of took her back a little bit because Brandon did not get up that early unless he had something to do and we already know he wasn't working that week. So she immediately called him and he didn't answer, which was kind of strange. He had just been texting her, um, but she figured he'll call back later. But by Tuesday night, he still had not gotten contact with her. So she decided to reach out to him, I believe at eight o'clock that night, as well as 10.08 PM that night, two times calling him to try to figure out plans for the following day to take him to lunch. But still, Brandon wasn't answering the phone. On Wednesday the 11th, she tried to call him again that afternoon, still nothing. Um, so at this point, she had gotten a little bit worried. He was a busy guy, but he seemed to be in communication with his family almost every single day. He talked to his sister a lot. He spoke to his mom a lot. He spoke to his dad a lot. So for him to just kind of be silent was weird. That Wednesday night, she reached out to his sister and expressed her concerns and said that if she couldn't reach him the following day, she was going to head over to his house and just check on him. So Thursday the 12th rolled around and she still could not get in contact with Brandon. So Brandon's mom, Sarah Lee, sent him a quick text saying, look, I'm coming over there to check on you. And at around 2.45 PM, she headed off with her daughter to his apartment on Church Street to see what was going on. When his mom, Sarah Lee, and his sister got to his apartment complex, they immediately noticed that his brand new truck that he just got for himself was sitting in the parking lot. So I'm sure a wave of relief flushed over them. He was the kind of person to stay up all night playing video games. So, you know, maybe he just did that and slept all day the past couple of days since he didn't have to work. He did have a headache. Maybe he was sick. Maybe he wasn't feeling well. Um, so they thought if they knocked on the door, he would answer. When they walked up to his apartment on the first floor level, they knocked and knocked and he was not answering. So they headed around to the very back of his apartment where there is a second door that kind of walks into the laundry room area. They knocked on this door a lot as well to the point where they're banging on it and still nothing. And that's when his mom, Sarah Lee, notices that the window uh, at the back of his apartment is broken. So this sends her into a panic. His car's there, he's not answering, and there's a broken window, something's wrong. So at around 3 p.m. that day, 911 is called. Authorities and EMTs arrive on the scene and they end up having to call the maintenance people out for a key to get into the apartment. And when the first responders went into the apartment, uh, Sarah Lee and Brandon's sister stayed outside. They heard the EMTs and everyone kind of working around in the apartment, but still weren't really sure what exactly was happening. What they didn't know was that the EMTs walked in to Brandon completely naked in a pile of water and blood on his bedroom floor, unresponsive. He was laying on his left side. He was horribly bruised and cut all over his body, quite literally all 
over his body. He was gasping for air. Thermostat in his house was set to, I believe like 62 degrees. So it was really cold in there. And for him to be lying in this water was just a very dangerous situation. So immediately he was put onto a gurney and pulled out of the house. Now, when he was brought out of the house, he had a blanket all the way up to his neck to try to warm him up. He had a neck collar on like one of the braces. His mom and his sister weren't really able to see the extent of his injuries, but what they did see was just alarming in itself. The right side of Brandon's face was horribly swollen and bruised. He had what is known as raccoon eyes, which is when, you know, you're, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, but it's when you have bruising all around your um, occipital area and swelling. And usually that's very indicative that there has been some sort of skull fracture. Um, he had a, a huge amount of blood that looked like it just came pouring from his nose. He wasn't moving. Um, it was a very scary situation. Authorities noticed that there was no sign of forced entry into the home. Both the front and the back door had been locked. And this suggested that if something was done to him, whoever did something had a key. I know that Narcan was in fact administered just in case, but there was no change at all. So at around 4 p.m., Brandon was taken to Randolph Hospital in Ashboro. So when he gets into this hospital, he is in the emergency room and right away the emergency doctors are telling his mom, this doesn't look good. You know, we really don't think he's going to survive whatever has happened to him. The first things that they did was realize that he was dealing with hypothermia. So they put on a bear hugger. It's essentially like this huge heated blanket or something like that, I believe, to try to get his temperature up. His temperature was very, very low. Um, and they also were just trying to assess what exactly, you know, what else was going on. They knew right off the bat, however, that these injuries were not something that was self-inflicted. They made this very clear because at this point, no one's really sure what happened. And Brandon's mom was repeatedly asking anyone she could really get her hands on, any of the nurses, any of the doctors, you know, what do you think happened? Like, do you think he fell? Do you think like he slipped? Like what could have possibly caused all of this? And all they kept saying was there's no way any of these wounds were self-inflicted. It got to the point that the Randolph Hospital in Ashboro realized that Brandon needed more care than they were able to provide for him. So they transferred him to a higher level of care at Moses Cone Hospital in Greensboro, which is very, very close. Greensboro is like the largest uh, city nearby. Once they made it to Moses Cone, Brandon ended up on three different forms of life support. He was on dialysis and they were still frantically trying to figure out what was going on. The hospital ran multiple tests, including running a toxicology panel um, and everything came back negative. So that's why the Narcan didn't do anything. There were no drugs in the system. The only thing that they saw was there was a really high level of diphenhydramine, which is essentially the main ingredient in Benadryl. And it's also used in a few different sleep aids. And there was a pretty good amount of this in his system. It seemed as if Brandon was essentially already decomposing according to what was told to his family. The doctor showed his mom sediment that was in his urine bag saying that his kidneys were already starting to fall apart. Um, it just, the prognosis was just not really good. And one of the nurses in the ICU told his mom that if she didn't know any better, she would believe this was someone that had been hit by a car. Authorities had already been to Brandon's home and looked around a little bit, and they also came to the hospital. Detectives wanted to speak to his family and ask a few questions. Um, again, authorities had it confirmed from medical professionals that Brandon did not self-inflict his wounds. They asked about Brandon being messy and his mom said, you know, yeah, he can definitely be a messy guy. They were referencing the state of his apartment, which at this point she didn't know, she hadn't been in there. Um, and they also asked if he had a girlfriend at the time and his sister who knew most about this said that he was just occasionally hooking up with people and he was not in any sort of relationship. 
The following day on September 13th, 2019 at 8.57 p.m., Brandon passed away. Um, he was not responding to pretty much any of the treatment. He His oxygen levels were still just flooring pretty much despite being intubated. Um, it was just not a good situation. So he was taken off of life support. And on the same exact day, authorities had decided to go ahead with a second search warrant of the house. The search warrant on the 13th states, but upon examination, it was learned that Mr. Embry suffered from injuries that were most likely not self-inflicted. Mr. Embry was wrapped in a heating blanket and a compression blanket due to his condition while at Randolph Hospital. It also stated, after the initial search warrant on the apartment was executed, detectives learned the extent of Mr. Embry's injuries are life-threatening and may have not been self-inflicted. Mr. Embry's injuries include what appear to be defensive wounds on his right palm, several contusions to his head, with one large contusion to the right side above his ear. A contusion is just a bruise. Mr. Embry also has contusions on his back, which are consistent with being struck with a hard object, such as a metal rod or a baseball bat. And Mr. Embry's nose appears to be broken due to it leaning to the right side. Several medical professionals stated to the detective that these wounds could not be self-inflicted. Due to Mr. Embry having several contusions on his head, inside his left upper arm and back that was previously unnoticed, this detective believes probable cause exists for another search of the apartment located at 711 South Church Street Apartment A to locate the weapon used to assault Mr. Embry. These weapons could include, but are not limited to any knives or blunt object that was used to make the contusion located on Mr. Embry's back, head, and upper arm. So that kind of gives a very brief description of the injuries that were on Brandon. Now I want to preface this by saying, and I probably won't mention it again, but his mom still was not able to see his injuries at full until months after the investigation ended up closing because authorities would not show them to her. And he had all of these things wrapped up on him when he was in the hospital. So she and the rest of the family weren't really aware of how bad the injuries were. Uh, but I want to go ahead and describe the injuries that he had right now to you guys. So Brandon was essentially bruised horribly head to toe. It probably would be easier to say where he wasn't bruised than it would be to say where he was bruised. Um, all of the bruises I will state were in different stages of healing, indicating that they did not all happen at the same time. So starting from the top, going down. He had horrible bruising all over his face. Again, he had the bruising around his eyes, the raccoon eyes, which is indicative of some sort of skull fracture. He had the swollen area on the right side of his face with bruising. You've heard he had the really bad bruise behind his ear. He had a bruise on the very back and base of his neck. His whole head was covered in just knots like goose eggs as if he had just been hit repeatedly on the head. A big round bruise over his heart and the medical records showed he had an enlarged heart, which could be due to blunt force trauma, explaining the bruise. Um, he also just had bruising all around his chest. He had bruising going all the way up the sides of his body on both sides. His arms were bruised, I mean, top to bottom. He had bruises on his biceps. Uh, it looked as if there were kind of like lines going down his biceps and bruising. He had different wounds on his hands, um, bruises, things that indicate defensive wounds that he was trying to protect himself, um, his fingers. I mean, just it's so hard to explain how bad the bruising was, which is why I included these pictures, just like in Melissa Platt's case, like you can't look at these and tell me this is something that was self-inflicted. It is important to show this. Um, he had bruising and cuts all down his back. His back was probably one of the most alarming things to me. Um, the scratches that were on his back, it also looked like there were like holes in his back as if he'd been like stabbed with something, maybe a screw or I'm not sure what some people have mentioned. It looks possibly like a taser mark. I personally don't know, um, but his back was horribly bruised right above 
His butt crack, like right there, is an absurd bruise. His butt cheeks were covered in bruises. His legs were covered in bruises. His knees, um, behind his knees, his genitals were horribly bruised, like almost black. Um, the tops of his feet, the bottoms of his feet were bruised. He was injured inside of his mouth. His frenulum was injured. Um, he also had bruising of his gums. His tongue was swollen and bruised. I mean, it is just absolutely insane. The level of injuries that this young man had. His feet were bruised. His ankles were bruised. Uh, just everything that was exposed was bruised. While at the house searching for a murder weapon, they were not just looking in the apartment, but they were also looking in his car. They had a warrant for both. I know that CSI came out and started processing the scene. And by the following Tuesday, his apartment was released back to the family. An autopsy was performed on September 16th by the chief medical examiner in Raleigh, North Carolina. And essentially what they first suggested was that he he did have an enlarged heart, so they wondered if that could have possibly contributed to his death. And they also said that he had a touch of pneumonia, but they were waiting for the toxicology report to come back in order to figure out definitively what they believed to have happened, which the family already knew there likely wasn't going to be anything that came back on that just because they had ran a drug test at the hospital and it came back with nothing other than diphenhydramine. So around this time, uh, the home was released back to the family and Brandon's dad and his uncle decided to go and start gathering his belongings and cleaning things up themselves. They didn't want his mom, Sarah, to really see any of that. This was devastating for their family. They were trying to figure out how their happy young son at 33 years old ended up beat all over his body in a locked apartment that resulted in his death. Um, and after a while, when they went to go and clean up the apartment, his mom was like, you know what? I feel like I need to be there. Like, this is something that I need to be a part of. She had to kind of mentally prepare herself for what she was about to see. And she went ahead in. Now, at this point, a lot of cleaning had already been done. So she wasn't seeing exactly what the scene was like when EMTs got into the, into the apartment. Um, but it didn't matter because what was still there despite the cleaning was disturbing. When she arrived, her husband and brother-in-law were still bagging items up and tossing items, throwing them in the trash, throwing them away. And one of the first things she noticed when she walked into Brandon's apartment was his moving boxes. Now, Brandon was coming up to his one year of his lease. He was supposed to be moving shortly and he'd been spending the past couple of weeks packing up his apartment. His mom had been there helping him. His sister had been there helping him and he was pretty much almost done packing up everything in his apartment. And while there were boxes everywhere, it appeared as if the, all the boxes had just been dumped out all over the place for absolutely no reason. Then she went further into the bedroom. He had a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment and his bedroom was like one of the first ones you get to, I believe. And the first thing she noticed there was that all of a sudden the house went from just being messy to covered in blood. There was a gigantic stain on the floor, which was the headprint of her son in blood that was just sitting there. Um, and you could very clearly see exactly where he was laying. You could see where his hair was, um, and you could see what appeared to be a spray of blood coming out of the back of where his neck was. Everything in his room was soaked with water. The EMTs arrived and found Brandon in his room. They stated that the bathtub was on and running and overflowing and water had just pulled out into the entire bedroom. Brandon, like I said, was 300 something pounds, a tall guy, and it was a really small bathtub. It didn't make sense as to why he would have had this bathtub running. He definitely couldn't fit in the bathtub, so this didn't make a lot of sense. All of the clothes that were on the floor were soaking wet. Brandon's pants that he had been wearing that day 
were inside out and it appeared as if they had pulled off, been pulled off by somebody else. Um, I'll show a picture so you can see just everything was pulled off in one quick swoop, um, inside out on the floor. There was like wads of paper, like soaking wet paper mixed with blood all over. She was able to see that there was one wall that the CSI had clearly marked for evidence purposes, but it was one wall out of literally the entire room. The more she looked, she said the more blood she saw. Like everywhere you looked, there was blood on every single wall. There were some places where blood went all the way up to the ceiling. His mattress was bare. The sheets and comforter had been pulled off of the bed and were in a bloody sopping wet pile when his dad and uncle got there. Um, and they said that it was so soaked full with water that it took two of them to get it into a trash bag and two of them to haul it to the dumpster. Needless to say, Brandon's mom told them to go and get it back and bring it back, especially because it was just covered in blood. The mattress itself was just also just covered in blood all along the sides. There was a blood soaked pillow with these weird round, like neon green spots all over it. There was an old pizza box. There were wicked ale apple beers that were on the bed. Um, blood was just everywhere. So he had two closets in his bedroom as well, a closet for his clothes. And then there was also a closet for his water heater and his head was facing the closet uh, with the water heater and his, feds and his feet were going back from there. Um, and on the outside of this water heater door and the inside, it was coated in blood. You could see where there had been so much water that there was water damage to the door itself. When they looked closer, for some reason inside of this water closet, there was blood, tons of blood over in the corner. There also, it also was just a wreck in there in general. Um, his mom, as I said, had been there. That closet was pretty much done. None of that stuff was supposed to be in there anymore. There was also a carpet cleaner that was inside of this closet. It was like just thrown in there and it looked as if the carpet cleaner had been used to suck up blood. It was like tinted orange where the water comes up through it. She then went into the bathroom and the bathroom was equally as horrific. It was pretty much torn apart. The shower bar was torn from the wall. The toilet paper holder was torn from the wall. The bathtub was covered in blood. No one had any idea where his shower curtain had gone. That was completely missing. The vanity mirror had been smashed out. All over the walls was more blood with like hair mixed in with it. The toilet, you guys, had been ripped from the floor. The entire toilet pulled up, like cracking it free from the tiles. The tile was torn up as well. And then the toilet tank lid on the back was literally broken in half. And one of them, one and a half was leaned up in the bathroom. The other one was in the bedroom. There was broken drywall behind the toilet. And when his mom looked closer, it looked almost as if there was like a spray that was going through the blood. Like when you spray something with a cleaner and the cleaner kind of drips down, there was just something dripping down through all of the blood. It looked like someone had tried to clean some of it up. When she spoke to her husband, her husband said he thought the same thing of the hallway outside of the room. Um, the entire hallway was completely clean up to the other bathroom. There was obvious bleach crystals that were on the floor left over. Uh, if you've ever like sprayed bleach somewhere, or used bleach somewhere and let it sit, then you'd know exactly what bleach crystals look like. It's like this white film. Um, and when his mom started looking further, she started noticing that white film on pretty much every inch of this apartment. There was a tray that he had or a little, there was a little cart that he had in the kitchen that had a couple of things on it, um, including a box 
and all over this entire cart was the same white film. One, there was a book in his living room that they actually had a picture of from a time that his sister had been over there and it showed the book completely pristine, but for some reason this book was on this bookshelf soaked in some sort of reddish brown liquid and then all over that bookshelf there was this white film. When you looked at his front door, um, there's the handle and right above the handle and the lock, you again see this like white spray. So at this point, they're thinking, you know, there's gotta be something going on here. And finally, when his mom pulls out the comforter that had been taken from the home, you can see this gigantic red spot in the middle of the comforter and the sheets that was clearly blood that had been mixed with water. So they immediately call the police department, the detectives on the case, Detective Suddeth and Detective Johnson. The male Suddeth was the lead on the case. Detective Johnson was just his partner um, and said, look, we need you to come out here immediately. They told authorities that there was this blood soaked comforter. And we're like, you know, don't you want this? Like, don't you want these things for evidence? And they were basically told, no, we have everything we need. But Detective Suddeth agreed to come out and take another look at the apartment. They began to point everything out on the window ledge. There was clearly blood underneath that. There was blood coating the mini blinds. Um, again, the mattress, the pillows, all of that wasn't taken. There was even what appeared to be some sort of like matter on the wall with hair mixed in with it, like a dark black looking hair. And this was interesting because Brandon did not have that color hair. He had like a reddish blonde colored hair. When the detective saw this and the CSI started looking at it, they were able to confirm that it did look like there had been a cleanup, that something was sprayed to try to clean up this mess. Um, in the living room area, there were Clorox wipes that were stuffed in random places. There was a Clorox wipe in the sink. There were gloves that were found um, randomly laying out in the kitchen. So it was confirmed that there was likely a cleanup that occurred. However, the female detective, Detective Johnson, ended up saying something that completely blew Sarah Lee's mind. She essentially said that she believed what actually happened was that Brandon used meth and went crazy. His mom immediately disagreed with this. Brandon had to regularly be drug tested because of the job that he did. He was not one to ever use drugs anyways. He was a chemist. He was very well aware of what things like meth can do to you and what they can be possibly cut with and the dangers of them. So he was not into that scene at all. Plus his talk screen came up negative at the hospital immediately when he was found. It didn't make any sense. And also there's this evidence of a cleanup, but nowhere in the room was there any sort of spray bottle that could have been used to spray the blood that was found in the bathroom. Detective Johnson suggested that people on meth do bizarre things and essentially said that Brandon must have beat himself got blood all over everything and then panicked and tried to clean up his own blood and mess and then somehow ended up naked on the floor, unable to move, comatose. This infuriated Brandon's family. There was no spray bottle ever found in his bedroom or anywhere in the apartment that he could have used to spray and try to clean up blood. It was very obvious that Brandon had never left his bedroom once the severe bleeding started. So if he had gone anywhere to clean anything up, including the hallway that was covered in bleach crystals, he would have continued leaving a trail of blood everywhere. You guys have seen the pictures. You understand how much blood is involved in this situation. Plus, where on earth was all of the cleaning solution and bleach that he used everywhere? There was bleach crystals on a ton of the apartment, but there was not any big empty things of bleach inside the apartment, indicating that all of this stuff had been taken out of the apartment. So not only did he come out of this bedroom covered in blood to clean up blood in the living room and hallway, but then also left his apartment covered in blood and threw these things away, came back in the house somehow not dripping blood everywhere and then ended up back in his bedroom. 
It wasn't making any logical sense. Plus this idea of meth never should have been suggested at this point because every single drug test came back negative. But Detective Johnson just kept on. She stated that when they initially came into the apartment that the air was really, really cold and that people who usually used meth would get hot. So clearly since his apartment was cold, he was trying to cool himself off because of the meth. But Sarah Lee was also able to explain this. When Brandon worked, you know, as a submariner, when he was around these nuclear reactors, there was a lot of radiation. And about two years prior to his death, he started to notice that there was something going on hormonally. He ended up going to see an endocrinologist and was prescribed HCG. He had very low testosterone levels. He had been taking this HCG for an extended period of time, two whole years, and never had any sort of issue with it other than the fact that it made him really hot. So between that and being 300 pounds, this really tall, burly guy, he kept his air very cold. Even when he went out of town, he kept it cold because he didn't wanna come back to a hot room. And I can tell you from experience living in this area, in North Carolina in September, it's freaking hot. It's like the hottest time of year. So this was entirely normal. Brandon's family still completely refused to believe in any way, shape or form that Brandon had done any of this to himself. The medical professionals didn't believe that. Detective Suddeth didn't believe that. It seemed to just be Detective Johnson that was so determined to make sure it was that he did this to himself. So at this point, Brandon's family pretty much realized they were going to have to do all of the investigating themselves. Um, his sister had taken a few photos of him while in the hospital to kind of document his injuries for herself. If that doesn't tell you that they already felt like something was going on here, they began to treat his apartment almost like a crime scene. They took videos of all of the blood that was found, pictures of pretty much everything. Um, and at this point, Sara Lee again was only going off of what she had personally seen, but things had already been cleaned up. So she still didn't even know the severity and the state of his apartment. And it was infuriating to hear that they asked if he was messy and they considered that messy. Um, and had she known the exact state his apartment was in, that's beyond. That is clear, obvious signs of a struggle. Um, so the fact that they dismiss that as him just being messy is absolutely devastating. Same day that Brandon's entire family went to clean out his apartment, Brandon's sister-in-law all the way in, I believe, Washington got a strange Facebook message from a woman named Cassandra. Now, this woman claimed that she was in a romantic relationship with Brandon. She basically said, hey, just want to let you know, like I was romantically involved with him. I loved him. I just heard of his passing. She said that she was supposed to see him on the 7th for his birthday. And when he didn't respond, she ended up going uh, and calling police and finding out that he had passed away and she told his sister-in-law that she had left some Bolero makeup products in his home that she wanted to get back and also asked if she could have something of his, like a shirt or something to remember him by. Um, and that's pretty much it. Now, this was a first for everyone. The sister-in-law passes information to Brandon's mom, Sarah. And at this point, they had no clue that he was so heavily involved with a woman. His mother said she wasn't one to really pry in his personal life, that if he ever met someone, she knew that he at the right time would introduce her to the family. So she let him kind of do his own thing. But his sister did say that there was a time back in February of that year that he mentioned that he was talking to this girl from Russia, but that it probably wasn't gonna work out because she was going back to Russia. Now on the 18th or 19th of September, his mom reached out to Cassandra because she herself wanted to ask questions and figure out, you know, there's obviously this part of him that we don't know about. We would love to talk to you about it essentially. And it took Cassandra a week to get back to Brandon's mom. While they were waiting for Cassandra to get back to them, Brandon's mom and dad decided that they needed to contact the police about Cassandra to let them know that he did in fact have a girlfriend. Clearly that was something of importance to them. They asked about it at the 
hospital and it was possible that she had valuable information. So they reached out to Detective Suddeth and let him know about this woman. Finally, on September 27th, Cassandra ended up messaging Brandon's mom back and confirmed that she in fact was his girlfriend. Cassandra told Sarah Lee that she had met Brandon back in January on a dating app called Hinge and that they spent most weekends together. She claimed to be wildly in love with him. She said that they had plans on moving in together, that they were going to open a joint bank account. Um, she referred to herself as his wife and just shared a bunch of very intimate details with his mom. Her communication was very abnormal. Um, I will put visuals up on the screen so you can see for yourself, but also I just wanna let you know, go to the Facebook page after this. There's two of them. I have it linked down below. You will see exactly what I mean if you don't get it in this video. It was odd. She was claiming all of these huge things, yet no one in the family knew about her. And even when she did respond and confess how deeply she loved him, she wasn't trying to figure out what happened to him. She didn't really ask any of the questions that his mom thought she would, like, you know, was there a service? Is there a place that I can go to pay my respects? Like, what can I do? Um, you know, anything like that. She wasn't asking those things, but what she was asking was, mind boggling to Sarah Lee. During their messages, Cassandra asks, was he found in bed or on the ground? And this seemed like a very odd question to ask. First of all, because this woman had absolutely no knowledge of what happened to Brandon. Nothing had been released to the public. The police were basically forbidding any of Brandon's family to speak to the media. So no information had been released on the case. So for her to speak about his bedroom and that's where he was found seemed a little bit odd. You wouldn't just kind of guess about that and you definitely wouldn't ask about it. And then she went on to ask if Brandon had been buried or cremated. Again, another very odd thing to ask. And even when she asked that, it's like, okay, maybe she just wanted to know so she could figure out if she could like go and see him where he was buried, but she never asked any of that. She literally just wanted to know if he was buried or cremated. She explained to his mom that she was supposed to see him on his birthday and that she waited for him for like two hours or something. And after not being able to reach them, she went to his parking lot pretty much and waited for him and that essentially he never showed up, he never said anything, so she just left. So all of this information goes to Detective Suddeth and he starts kind of running his own investigation in the background and ends up getting a warrant on Brandon's phone and finds that Brandon had in fact been in contact with this Cassandra individual as well as another female. Now Cassandra is apparently from South Carolina and this other female Olivia was from is from Virginia. And according to Detective Suddeth, he was in very heavy communication with both of these women, but he spoke to Olivia 10 times more than he spoke to Cassandra. And while he was trying to figure out the best way to reach out to these women and figure out what was going on, Shirley was pretty much doing her own investigation. So on the 10th of October, Cassandra agreed to meet with Sarah Lee and Brandon's sister at a Dunkin' Donuts in Asheboro. And when they arrived, immediately it seemed off. Cassandra was visibly shaking. Uh, she seemed very nervous. She wasn't talking much. They went in and grabbed coffees and she just sat quietly with her hands in her lap and basically just listened to all the stories that Sarah had to tell. She eventually did bring up more about her relationship with Brandon and said that Brandon meant basically the world to her. She said that Brandon had been there for her and was on the phone with her when she caught her husband, yes, I said husband, in bed with another woman. And she talked about how betrayed she felt by her husband and how devastated she was and how Brandon helped fix all of that for her. And all Sarah Lee could think of was this woman's talking about how devastated she is that she, that she caught her husband in bed with another woman and had been betrayed while she was on the phone with someone she wasn't married to that she met on a dating site. It didn't seem right. And Cassandra also kept using phrases and this is something that continues through all of the time they were in communication that again are common phrases, but according to Sarah Lee, the way they were said was abnormal. 
um, like she kept bringing up Walmart and she continued to bring up Walmart the entire time she spoke to Sarah Lee and for the next 10 months. But in this first meeting, she spoke about how she and him went to Walmart and there was a blender that they forgot to pay for. And Brandon being the great guy he was, went back up, said, hey, look, we forgot to ring this blender up. And the employee essentially waved him on and said, don't worry about it. And she kept saying, you know, we got away with murder. We got away with murder. And when she had mentioned finding her husband in bed with another woman, she kept saying, I could have killed him. Sarah Lee asked to see, you know, the last messages that Cassandra had with, her son and Cassandra did hand over her phone. She did instruct her to not scroll up. She claimed that there was some sexting happening above that and that it was nothing that the mom needed to see. Uh, but clearly she didn't care too much because of something she said to the mom. We'll get to that. She was able to see the conversation that Cassandra had with Brandon or the one-sided conversation, I should say, for the days that Brandon is thought to have been out. Now, according to what the doctors said when Brandon was in the hospital, they said he had been down for a pretty long time. So they're thinking at least like Monday or Tuesday. Sarah thought this was very possible because she thought had always thought the text messages from Brandon during those days didn't sound like him. He was up really early on Tuesday morning, which was unlike him, and she immediately called him after he texted and he didn't answer. So something just seemed weird. Now, despite the fact that Cassandra was just so in love with him and they spent so much time together. Cassandra said that she did not have any communication with Brandon on Wednesday and Thursday. She said that Tuesday was the last time she spoke to him and they decided on this mutual agreement that she would not contact him Wednesday and Thursday because they were gonna see each other Friday. Cassandra said that she had MS and there was a flare up happening at the time and she just wanted to rest and relax and not have to worry about anything until they were supposed to meet on Friday to spend his birthday together that Saturday. So she basically was explaining why she wasn't in contact with him and couldn't say what he was doing that Wednesday and Thursday. But when she showed the text messages to Brandon's mom, it's very obvious that she was reaching out to him in a panic over those days, which doesn't add up to what she was saying. You can see on Thursday when they weren't apparently supposed to be talking to each other because they agreed on that, she texts Brandon, great to know that I'm worried sick about yous. My MS is effing up because Mies is worried and I have no idea where yous is. And this is also something that Cassandra would typically do in her messages to Sarah is she would add these S's in. She said that she was from Russia, English was her second language. And so I guess she just had issues with that. Then she says, are yous in jail in a hospital? Gave up on Mies, who effing knows? Wees have a concert tomorrow if you're going. Then on Friday, she says, hello, but she doesn't say anything until all the way at the end of the day, almost midnight, and says, WTF, this is really frustrating. Are you trying my to my nerves? I'm about to call the cops and do a wellness check on yous. And then again, the next morning, hello. And then again, later that afternoon, now I'm getting pissed. I have no idea where you are or if your current condition is life altering or even if you're dead. Great way to make me effing worry. Obviously for someone who was apparently not supposed to have any contact with him, it's odd that she immediately thought he was in jail or the hospital. Like why would that be your first assumption when you apparently have this agreement to not speak to someone for two days is that they're not responding because they're in jail or the hospital. And then she's so worried, but then she immediately talks about going to a concert the next day. And then that Friday, she says that she's gonna call the cops to do a wellness check, but she never did that. Um, she also didn't speak to him the entirety of that day. If they were supposed to see each other that day, I would assume she would have reached out to him early in the morning. And then you finally have Saturday where she talks about his current condition being life altering or even if he's dead. Again, that seems like kind of a weird thing to jump to. Um, it was just a really, it's a weird conversation. It's a very, very weird conversation. Over the next couple of days, they continue to speak and Cassandra starts really letting loose on her relationship with Brandon and these details. She also started to talk a lot about herself. She claimed she grew up in a very dangerous place in Russia. She said that her dad was in a Russian prison at the time. Um, she also mentioned the fact that she herself was a felon. She said that she worked as a nurse in a level five prison. And from my understanding, I thought there were only four levels. I could be wrong. Let me know down below. 
Um, and she also was adding in other strange things. She said that she had been pregnant before with Brandon's child, but that something happened. Um, she spoke about all sorts of things in relation to Brandon and that she liked how he would rub her leg and the way that he would touch her hips. And she mentioned the fact that he bought her all these beauty products and he was supposed to give those to her when she came that Friday and that he never got to do that. And when talking about that, she spoke about how he would like be with her putting face masks on and how he would like call her in to shower with him because he loved to wash her hair. I mean, intimate things that you wouldn't really say to that person person's mom. I mean, it f made me feel uncomfortable um, hearing her talk about the way he would like run his hand up her leg. It was just kind of strange. It, it honestly sounded like you were reading a fantasy novel. Like she would play out him walking in and coming up behind her and kissing her on the back of the neck with his arms wrapped around her belly. I mean, literally that's exact. I mean, you can go read the text yourself. That's quite literally one of the things that she said. Around this time, Detective Suddeth finally reaches out to both women um, and is able to confirm this Cassandra individual and basically wants to bring them both in for questioning. And he also speaks to Olivia and encouraged her to reach out to Sarah. October 12th, 2019, Sarah and Olivia speak. Now, Sarah says that she is from Virginia. She said that she actually only met Brandon one time for a couple of hours. She said that they also met on some sort of dating app, which she couldn't say what dating app it was, which was kind of important to Sarah because she's trying to figure out, you know, are there more women? You know, what kind of app was he on where he was able to like match with someone that's over two hours away? If you guys know of any, let me know down below. Uh, she was just very confused. Now, Olivia didn't really have a lot of answers. She was very, very vague when she spoke to everyone. According to Detective Suddeth, she seemed all right. Uh, but Sarah definitely questions a lot of the things that she has said. So she told Sarah she didn't remember what app it was on that she met Brandon, but could specifically remember his profile picture. She remembered the first conversation that they had. I don't know if they were technically romantically involved or not from what I have heard his mom say. She just like thought he was a really cool guy after meeting him and you know went on to keep talking to him. Sarah ended up asking Olivia for photos of Brandon. She was like, you know, I have a few photos of him, but clearly he led the social life that I didn't know of. So if you have any pictures, I would love to see them. But Olivia said that she had just recently decided to get a new phone. She actually entirely switched carriers and that she didn't back anything up properly. Uh, so she didn't think she had any, but she said she would go ahead and check the cloud. And so after this, Sarah went back to Cassandra and asked Cassandra for photos of him as well, only for Cassandra to also say that she decided to get a new phone and lost everything. After this, Sarah is speaking to Olivia about the last time Olivia spoke to Brandon, and she's also very vague about this. She says she couldn't really remember anything. The reason why his mom asked this is because she was the last person that he spoke to on the phone. So Olivia had placed a call to Brandon about an hour and a half after his mom called him that Tuesday. So his mom called him at eight and at about 9.26, Olivia called Brandon and there was some sort of conversation for 13 minutes. And then at 10.08, when his mom called, again, no answer. And his mom thought it was very strange that he would answer the phone and speak to Olivia for 13 minutes, but ignore both of her phone calls on either side of that. But again, she didn't remember anything about the conversation. A couple of days later, despite saying that she didn't know what app she met Brandon on, she told his mom that she tried to get on there, the app that she used because she loved his profile picture. But upon trying to sign in, she realized she deleted her account. Uh, so again, just kind of like contradictory. But what Olivia was able to say was that the two days, the same two days as Cassandra, that Wednesday and Thursday, she did not have any communication with Brandon. She said she did not speak to him. 
Now, while Cassandra said she didn't have any communication with him because her MS was flaring up, Olivia said that she didn't have any communication with him because in her words, he was being pissy. She claimed that Brandon was upset that she couldn't come and see him for his birthday, so he wasn't speaking to her. So you can clearly see how this is odd. These two women, both were apparently dating Brandon or talking to him frequently, both got new phones after his death and lost everything on their old ones. Um, they both were apparently not talking to him the two days that he was down and out on his bedroom floor. Both of their stories for why they weren't talking to him didn't add up to their actions. Cassandra, because she was contacting him during these days, she said she wasn't supposed to. And when it comes to Olivia, why would he have been upset she couldn't come down for his birthday when he obviously, according to Cassandra, had plans to be with her? Sarah reached out to Cassandra a few more times, trying to get information from her phone, other text messages and pictures and all of these things. And Cassandra kept telling her that her phone was acting up, that she couldn't get to anything. There's this new phone problem. She can't get into her old phone. And Cassandra told Sarah that her and Brandon's phone automatically deleted each other's texts. Um, which is not something that happens. They were on two separate carriers. There's no way for someone, it just, it didn't make any sense. I know there is a setting in the phone where after a certain amount of days, it will delete your texts automatically, but she said that their phones without prompting automatically deleted each other's text messages. Um, and then just after his death as well, his mom noticed that his Facebook page changed in privacy settings. You could no longer see his friends list. Sandra also went on to tell his mom how exactly she found out Brandon had died. She said that she went to his apartment complex about a week after his death to check on him. And when she got there and was banging on the door, a neighbor came outside and said, you know, he passed away. Cassandra claimed she was using a cane that day because of her MS. And when she heard this, she became hysterical and had to use the cane to stand upright. She was falling over. She said that she yelled at this neighbor saying, you're a liar, there's no way this is true. And then she frantically went back to her car. Um, and that was that. So out of this idea, this thought that Cassandra was not being honest, Sarah went back to Brandon's apartment complex and spoke to this neighbor herself and said, hey, I was just wondering, you know, did someone come here knocking on Brandon's door? This neighbor said that a woman did in fact come to Brandon's apartment and began to bang on the door. So the neighbor came outside, informed her that Brandon had passed away. And at this point, apparently Cassandra reached her hand out and said, okay, thank you. Shook this neighbor's hand, walked back to her car and immediately got on the phone. That's a completely different version of events to what she told Sarah had happened. On October the 15th, Cassandra also messages Sarah saying that she was having a really rough day. She said that someone got a hold of her bank account and took a lot of her money. And Sarah didn't think anything of this at first, expressed her, you know, she told her she was sorry that happened. That's really rough. But then Sarah questioned what exactly Cassandra had told her when she found out that that same day, Brandon's bank account had pretty much been drained. He had a loan that had to be paid off. And since his passing, they took the $13,000 out of his account um, to go towards the loan. So it just seemed odd that the same exact day that happened after Cassandra was trying to say, oh, we're like getting a bank account together, we're moving in together. She had basically said in her own words that she was entitled to his money because they were going to be married. It was odd that she said, oh, someone took my money. Then on October 25th, they all met again, Cassandra, Sarah, and Brandon's sister. They met at a restaurant in Asheboro. And for some reason, Cassandra started again with repeating these odd phrases. She kept saying, don't be a cop caller. And at this point, 
No one's really pointing anything out. Sarah and Brandon's sister are just trying to keep this woman talking because of the things that she's saying. They felt she had information. So they just kind of looked at each other and kept on going. Then again, in November, they met at the Ashboro Mall. I believe they met at a bookstore in the mall and had a conversation. And in this conversation, Sarah says she remembers that Cassandra began to cry and was kind of wiping tears off her eyes. But the closer Sarah looked, the more she realized that Cassandra was not actually crying. There were no tears that were coming off. And under her breath, she kind of whispers, I'm going to jail. And again, Sarah and Brandon's sister are just shocked at what they're hearing. And Cassandra never explains what she means. Then while they're looking at books during this time, Cassandra also randomly looks up and says, my name's actually Lincoln, and then moves past that as well. Like she didn't just say she has a completely different name than she's been going by this entire time. This strange behavior just kept on continue. This random blurting out of bizarre things, like she's going to jail, she has a different name than she does, um, don't be a cop caller. She apparently would speak in almost like a baby talk when she would be upset about Brandon, but then if anything happened that made her mad or she was speculating as to what happened to him, she would sound like an entirely different person. She also was just continuing to give very intimate details about her relationship with him, how many kids they planned to have, that he was going to move with her to Washington. And on the 7th of November, she was on a Facebook audio call with Sarah and began to talk about the crime scene. She started to mention Brandon's bathroom and this dream that she had been having about how he was standing by the closet and guarding the closet and how he was white as a ghost and how he fell to the floor and was talking about how, oh, this all started in the bathroom or this all started in the kitchen. She was just mentioning all these things that matched up with the crime scene that she shouldn't have known. And while speaking about these dreams in November, she would say things like, well, according to the detective, but she had yet to speak to the detective. She actually wasn't supposed to go in until I believe November 18th or 19th for an interview and to speak with them. She even mentioned sleeping pills. That was one thing that she constantly brought up randomly. Like we took the same brand of sleeping pills, the Equate Walmart sleeping aid. They're like little, uh, pills with like greenish blue fluid in it. And when Brandon's family was going through the apartment, they found these pills everywhere. There were like three bottles of them in the apartment. They were on the floor. There were some of them that looked like they had been like cut open and squeezed out. And interestingly enough, the main ingredient in this Walmart sleep aid is diphenhydramine. And that was the one thing that was found in large quantities in his system. And somehow this woman is repeatedly bringing it up. She even mentioned this idea that maybe he tried to end his life by taking a ton of the sleeping pills. Then on November 19th, she was supposed to go and speak to the detectives for the first time. And she ended up calling Brandon's mom frantic. And this is recorded, so I'm going to play it for you now. I get too mad because I don't understand other human behaviors in that aspect of life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I work really hard every single day. I'm frustrated. And then I called twice. And then he's like, oh, I thought I, like, press the accept button. And, I, and then he hung up on me. And I called back. And he was like, I'm sorry, there's another phone call that came in. And I just want to sit down and have a conversation with you face to face. And I was like, well, I'm not in trouble. I've done nothing to him. Or uh -huh. anybody else for that matter. Yeah. You know, I'm not out here hurting anybody. He's like, I didn't think that you did hurt him. I just want to know what you feel as that person. And I was like, well, I told you, like, over the telephone. What else do you want me to tell you? Yeah. <laughs> That's the shit that kills me. Yeah. You know, the last text which I got from him, you saw it yesterday. Yeah. And he seemed good after the fact. Like, he seemed good. You know what I mean? I talked to him and he seemed okay. Yeah. But what the fuck happened? Mm -hmm. But when I call the detective, they don't answer to me. I don't know. I'm just stressed now. I don't want to be stressed out. I don't think. I don't, I don't think you should stress out. I'm stressed out at the moment. And I don't want to be stressed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just want 
him to come home, and he's never coming home. I'm never going to get a phone call. I'm never going to get another iPhone. It's like a bullshit. The only thing I could tell him is, like, sleeping pills and energy pills and testosterone. Oh, God, I'm so stressed out now. So I called my father, but that's not it. So stressful to me. Yeah. Try not to let it stress you out. He had a lot of sleeping pills. I know that much. Mm-hmm. But when he took too many of them, I don't think so. You know, I, I can't see him doing that either. I don't see him doing anything to, like, jeopardize his life. He had a really good little life going on for himself. Yeah, I think he did too. This is the shit that stresses me out. Yeah. I don't know what to do. You know, I'm too good of a person. That's what Brandon always said. I was too good of a person. You're too good of a person? Aw. Mm-hmm. He always said that whenever you got to know me, you got to know that I was actually a really decent human being. Mm-hmm. But until you got to know me, I was very good. So I don't know what to think at the moment. Honest to God. You know, tell them what you know. That'll help them figure out things about Brandon. And again, like I said, that's that's helping Brandon. That's letting Brandon have peace. I just don't want to find out that he... What if he did something stupid? I don't think he did, but... Like, it's been a long time for a fucking corner's report. Yeah. At least in my opinion, that's a very long time. Yeah, I agree. I had other people die in my life, and they didn't take that long for a fucking coroner's report, you know. And I like to think about was, like, what would he do when this detective called and I was at the grocery store? Like, what the hell does he want? Like, why are you calling me? Like, I gave you everything you wanted. I miss him. I wish he was here, damn it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Like, yeah. Yeah. It would be very, very easy. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like, it makes me wonder. Like, they might know. What if? They, like, I think this is my PTSD, though. I wonder what they know versus what they don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what do you know that I don't know? What do you know that his mom doesn't know? Mm-hmm. You know, so maybe my brother's right. Like, I texted my brother and I told him, like, the detective called and wants to meet me. And then he was like, well, you should just go meet him and see what he has to tell you. Mm -hmm. Like, the most he's going to do is just be like, hey, like, I want to know more about Brandon's life. And he's not going to give a shit about what your life is like. He doesn't want to know about your life. He just wants to know about Brandon's. Yeah, exactly. You know, he doesn't care what you do for a job. He does not give a fuck what you do. Mm-hmm. Who are you talking to or anything else? So mm-hmm. just do it. But yeah. you know, I'm such a guarded human that I don't like to tell people about my life with yeah. Brandon. But that's private to me. And Sarah mm-hmm. immediately contacted the detective that night saying, look, this is what she said to me. At this point, she was just pushing all the information she could to the detective. And sure enough, the following day, she called in saying that she had food poisoning and couldn't come in. She continued talking about her dreams after this, which basically was just detailing the crime scene. She spoke about how she thought he uh, went into septic shock, which he did, according to medical records. At this point, Detective Sudis strongly believed they had something here. They're like, the information she's saying, the things that she knows about this crime scene that she shouldn't know unless she was there, you know, there's got to be something to this. So he looks deeper into her phone records. He finds that she was speaking to someone in a prison in Virginia, which, you know, doesn't really tell them much of anything. But this other woman, Olivia, is from Virginia, and it makes them question, uh, do these two know each other somehow? December 4th, she was set to go and speak to detectives. And prior to this, she just continues to hand over questionable information to Brandon's mom. She starts to talk about the fact that she had 13 to 14 people in the past two and a half years of her life in her life die. And this was alarming to Sarah. Uh, Her son obviously died while knowing this woman. She spoke about how she knew all these different people that had died from car accidents and overdoses. Majority of them died from overdoses. And I just want to point out that's very odd. 
Um, she also spoke about the fact that when she was 16, she had a twin sister and this twin sister died in a car accident. And she was the one who lived and she felt guilty about it. She talked about having a child, a daughter when she was, I think 15 years old. And that at a year old, her daughter got caught up in a blanket and suffocated and died. She said that she was staying with a woman named Dee Dee when she was in Ashboro. That's who she would stay with while she was there. And this friend died within a couple of days of Brandon that she was sick, but she couldn't really explain more other than that. And this, so it was odd. And Sarah's mom reached out to the detectives and were like, and said, you know, is this normal to have this many people fall out and die around you in the matter of two years? Or is she possibly a serial killer? Like, is she connected to this? According to what Sarah has said, Dee Dee allegedly died of an overdose on cold medicine, um, along with psychosis. And that's, you know, some things are just starting to match a little bit too much. On December 4th, finally, they were able to get Cassandra in to speak with authorities. She was questioned for two hours pretty extensively. And this is where she said that she was still married and living with her husband. And this entire time she referred to her husband as her ex-husband. She made it seem as if she didn't live with him anymore. You know, after all, he had cheated on her while she was cheating on him. Um, it was just an absolute disaster, but she was in fact still married to him and living with him. Um, and she said, she said that she had only come to see Brandon a total of three to four times, um, which is interesting because he was in the hospital four times over the period that he knew her, um, otherwise very healthy by the way, but we'll get deep into that. And when they asked her what she was doing when Brandon was assaulted, she said she was at home in bed without any hesitation. Now this is important because at this point in time and literally to this day, authorities never made a timeline. They never tried to establish a timeline of what happened, when it happened, how long Brandon was on the floor. You know, they never tried to establish a timeline at all. The only thing that they were able to find is that he went two places on Tuesday, but they're not even sure it was him. The card was used once at a restaurant in the mall um, that Tuesday where he ordered a total of like almost $18 in food, uh, which his family found out is enough food for two people. So he had to have been with someone or it was two people together eating and not him. His card was also used at an Adam and Eve nearby and and that was at like 11 or so in the morning. And according to what the employee said, what was bought was for a female. Those are the only two places that show Brandon's whereabouts after he leaves his parents' house on Saturday. That's quite literally it. He did order pizza on Sunday night. Um, but again, no one knows if he's the one who got that or not. After that, it's nothing. This is all what his family has found. And even though they've handed this information over to authorities, no security footage was gotten in time there's pretty much nothing to it. So they didn't know a day he was assaulted. They didn't know what time. And the fact that they asked her and she immediately said, you know, I was at home in bed. She's either really trying to create an alibi for herself or she knew exactly when what happened to him happened. They asked her when the last time she saw Brandon was as well, and this also is very questionable. She said that she was last in town for Brandon's birthday. She said she was there during the start of September. Well, we know Brandon wasn't in town until the 5th. Um, on the 6th, he was at work. On the 7th of his birthday, he was at his parents' house um, and she apparently had plans cancel with him. She had mentioned to his mom that they had pizza one night before all of this happened. There was a Domino's pizza box from that Sunday. So she could have been over there on Sunday. It was interesting that she's over there Sunday and by Monday, he's not feeling well. And she said she came back after about a week because she hadn't heard from him. Um, this is when, you know, they weren't talking to each other. They were supposed to see each other that Friday. And she said at this point, she called police uh, because she was worried about him and they told her he was dead. So also to police, she completely leaves out the story that she went and saw this neighbor and just immediately says she called them. So Detective Suddeth looked back and tried to find any sort of confirmation that she called the police department asking about Brandon and he could not find any record of her calling. It did in fact show the detective, the text messages, the last ones that she sent to Brandon when she was very concerned and saying she didn't know if he was in jail or what was happening. 
And when he saw this, he asked her if she would consent to a phone dump. They basically would have to go to the sheriff's department and Randolph and hook her phone up to a computer and it would take everything off of her phone. And she agreed to this. So he decided to leave the room and call the sheriff's department to make sure that could be done that day. Now, when he left to make this call, he caught Cassandra frantically pull her phone out the second he left the room and start furiously typing on her phone or doing something on her phone, which he thought was odd. When he went back in there, her phone was away and he said, follow me to the sheriff's department. They got in the car, she was behind him and the entire way to the sheriff's department, he was watching in his rear view mirror and she had her phone up at the steering wheel as she was driving, still frantically doing something on her phone. When they got to the sheriff's department, they hooked her phone up. When the dump was done, it revealed that all data had been erased prior to the phone being hooked up. So the detective, Detective Siddharth had seen all of the texts that she had sent him just hours prior. And then all of a sudden she's fur furiously on her phone knowing she's about to have a phone dump done and everything is gone and it had been there. Authorities believed she had been trying to get rid of any sort of information on her phone. They didn't know if that was her trying to delete everything, maybe a factory reset, or if she was texting someone to warn them about something or ask them how to get this information off of her phone. But either way, for some reason, she cleared her phone the second she knew the information was going to be taken off of it. So. So authorities apparently got a warrant again and wanted to figure out her GPS location over the days that Brandon was thought to be in his apartment knocked out. They wanted to see who she had been contacting when she was in the police department and heading towards the sheriff's department. Um, and detective Suddeth had reached out to the family and he was like, you know, we're close. I think we've got something. I'm waiting for this warrant to come back and then I'll let you know, I'll contact you tomorrow. But the following day, they never received any contact back. And when they started to call repeatedly, he wouldn't answer his phone. This was his line. There was nothing. Usually he would text them, still nothing. And they ended up finding out that that next day he had been taken off of the case and promoted to traffic. So he was no longer on it. And Detective Johnson, the female, had taken over the same one that still swore meth is what caused him to, to hurt himself and killed him. Um, and nothing more was done. They never found out any more information about the phone that Detective Siddharth had initiated. This was devastating because Brandon's family knew there was something more to this. Cassandra in December had admitted to knowing where the spare key was. She said that Brandon would often leave the door open for her. And since it was thought that, you know, whoever may have harmed him had a key because the door was locked behind them. It was alarming that she was the one person to confess to knowing about a spare key. They turned his entire apartment upside down and were never able to find it. The medical examiner ended up getting the toxicology report back and basically said that he died from complications due to pneumonia, that it was a natural death. Sarah asked how on earth it went from he has a touch of pneumonia to now his cause of death is due to pneumonia um and the the superficial injuries on his body were had had no direct correlation to his death that's what was said the superficial wounds to his body. This medical examiner had originally said that there was just a touch of pneumonia. Now that the toxicology report came back, they said that the pneumonia actually involved four out of five of his lobes and his lungs at 100%, which is drastically different from just a touch of pneumonia. And at this point, I believe his mom also had his medical records. 
Um, and it was like 500 something pages and it showed that he was tested for pneumonia while in the hospital and he never had it. He tested negative. So then his mom started asking, you know, you know, okay, sure. Let's say that he maybe did have pneumonia. Uh, could him laying in the water that was in the room possibly have caused this pneumonia? And that's when the Emmy revealed that she had absolutely no idea that Brandon was laying in water when EMT arrived. She had no idea he was hypothermic despite having access to all of the medical records. She did not have any idea half of what was going on prior to his death, which is incredibly important when it comes to performing an autopsy and determining a cause of death. She went on to say that because there was not a large amount of blood at the crime scene, that it did not indicate there was any sort of foul play involved. Um, with his superficial wounds and that again, he just died from pneumonia and his mom was just shocked because his apartment was covered in blood. And after asking multiple questions, she ended up finding out that Emmy also didn't see numerous pictures from the crime scene, like the blood soaked pillow and a handful of other things. And his family was upset because they felt like they were just fighting with a brick wall. Um, they found out that, again, Detective Johnson had been at the autopsy and essentially asked, and essentially the Emmy asked, you know, what are you looking for? She at this point claimed there had to be meth involved with absolutely no evidence suggesting there was meth. Meth was never found in his apartment. Meth was never something that was found on a toxicology report. Um, he was frequently drug tested at his job and it was never found. She then switched from that to saying that he had apparently been smoking synthetic marijuana and that explained everything. However, still there was never any synthetic marijuana that was found in his home. When asking about how pneumonia, you know, could have played a part in all of this wound, all of these wounds that he self-inflicted, she was told hypoxia that when you have that lack of oxygen that you can become irrational and can act all sorts of crazy. Um, and then eventually the cause of death being pneumonia was even changed. Apparently it was changed from pneumonia natural death to undetermined. And it mentioned in the notes that he had used synthetic marijuana. I have found that there was kratom that was found in the home, but it was bought two years prior in Washington and it had pretty much not been used. It was completely full and Kratom is legal in Washington and North Carolina. So he wasn't using any sort of crazy recreational drug. According to his sister, he said that he didn't like it. And so he didn't use it. There was even a time where the pathologist told the family that they were considering that maybe his death was due to alcohol withdrawal. I kid you not. This is the amount of times they bounced around to all of these crazy reasonings as to what caused him to die and beat himself. There was in fact alcohol found in his home, but it was not a situation where he drank alcohol regularly. The beers that were on his bed were not beers that he would typically drink and they were closed. Um, there was a thing of fireball in the freezer, but that was confirmed to be an ex-girlfriend's and it was pretty much full. There was a bottle of Svedka and a bottle of rum that Cassandra claimed were hers um, and they weren't empty either. There was another bottle of alcohol that discontinued in 2016 and his mom said that she believed he actually got it back in 2010. So it had just been sitting there. All the alcohol in his house was just like covered in dust and full. Like he didn't drink alcohol like that. There's also a point where authorities apparently told a local reporter that his mom stated he abused steroids, um, which is also not the case. He was prescribed HCG and somehow this got out and was reported to the public and has not been changed at all. They also said that they found a marijuana scale in his apartment. However, he was a chemist and also a bodybuilder. Uh, so it's very common to have that in your home. I have like three all over my house from measuring out supplements and all of these different things. And he packed his own supplements as well. So he would use it often. There's also no such thing as a marijuana scale. There's just a scale. Um, so it was kind of forcing this idea out there to prove their point when nothing even added up.
February 14th, 2020 is when his mom obtained all 539 pages of his medical records. And once she finally started to look into things deeper, she believed that Brandon was poisoned uh, or he had ethyl glycol poisoning, which is essentially being poisoned with antifreeze. And right beside his front door was a large jug of antifreeze. This brings us to all of the times that Brandon had been hospitalized after he met Cassandra. So as I said, in the past six months of his life before he died, he was severely ill six times and, seek, and went to seek medical attention five times, the last and fifth time being when he passed away. So this all started in February of 2019, shortly after Valentine's Day. And this actually happened 10 days after Brandon told his sister that he was seeing this woman from Russia, AKA Cassandra. Um, and she also confirmed she was with him for Valentine's Day. On the 18th to the 22nd of February, Brandon was in a medically induced coma intubated in the hospital, in the ICU. His mom was not told till the very end of his trip. And when she got there, no one really gave her a lot of information on how on earth her son ended up in this position. He was a pretty healthy guy. Um, and come to find out on the 18th, Brandon had gone into work as usual, which ties into what I said before on why they may have let him go. Um, but he came into work as usual and his job noticed that he was in an altered state is what they called it. He was not acting himself and they were concerned that he either had taken drugs or was exposed to something while on the job. So they sent him to get a drug test done for safety purposes. So while he was on his way there, he decided to stop at McDonald's and get himself some breakfast. It was early on in the morning. And when he was at McDonald's, other individuals also noticed Brandon acting odd. He was apparently projectile vomiting in the parking lot. And then he would lay down in the back of his car screaming. So at around 9.20 AM, ambulance arrived on scene along with authorities. And it became clear very quickly that Brandon had no idea what was going on. He seemed to be in a state of confusion. He didn't seem to be aware that he was acting strange. He didn't seem to be aware that he was violently ill and throwing up. So he had to be escorted to the hospital. Um, and they basically started asking him a bunch of questions. Brandon said that since 2 a.m. that morning, he had a very bad headache. Uh, he said that he was at work and they thought he was on drugs. They sent him to do this drug test. And then all he remembered was that he went to McDonald's and then all of a sudden got really bad abdominal pain. And I guess at that point he started to throw up. Um, so he was able to answer some questions as if he had recollection, like he had this headache, he wasn't feeling well, why he'd been sent back from work, but he also had absolutely no idea how he got to the hospital. He could not figure out how to work the bathroom door at the hospital. He had to have help. Um, and he was very unsteady on his feet and eventually he fell unconscious. So he was transferred to the ICU where he was put on dialysis. It was determined that he was in respiratory distress, but they could not figure out why. He didn't have pneumonia. There was nothing else coming back. They did a drug test, which he would have gotten anyway, and the entire talk screen came back completely clear. There was no illicit drugs. He had already told them when speaking to them that he didn't take street drugs, that he wasn't into that sort of thing. They ultimately never figured out what was wrong with him. When they first took him out of the coma, he lost his mind, he freaked out, which is understandable. Coming out of that is not something that's easy. You see it all the time when people are put under for surgery, they come out, they're upset, they're sometimes aggressive. Um, that's exactly what happened to him. He'd been down for five days. And so when they brought him out, he was aggressive. He's also 300 pounds. And so they put him back under and said that he was suffering from psychosis, which is not exactly the case necessarily. He was just coming out of intubation and a medically induced coma. And they finally released him from the hospital. He seemed to have no idea what happened. Like at this point, he just had no clue why he was in there. He didn't understand how he got there. He thought he had been profiled as a drug user and had been sent to the hospital. Like that is what he 
remembered. While in the hospital, he had neurological failure, sepsis, abnormal blood, low blood pressure, severe headache, crystallization, um, and blood in his urine, vomiting, psychosis, respiratory failure, renal failure, circulatory failure, comatose, pinpoint pupils, all these different things. And interestingly enough, those are all symptoms of ethylene glycol poisoning. And again, lungs were clear, no pneumonia. After being released, he was expecting a friend to come in from Seattle. This is when he realized in February that his spare key was missing. The same key that he apparently would leave out for Cassandra, but he had just met her. Um, you know, we know she had a key because she I, I admitted going into his apartment one time when he wasn't there to put Red Bulls in his apartment. Um, so it really started to seem like she had taken the spare key. Two months later, in April of 2019, he ended up in the hospital again, Randolph Hospital. He, this time he was suffering from syncope, which basically means that he was fainting just repeatedly over and over and over again. He said he was having severe stomach pain. There was nausea, there was vomiting. Ultimately, they couldn't figure out what was going on and he was released. Another two months later, in June of 2019, he went into urgent care complaining of the same stomach pain uh, and saying that he felt really hot. Again, no one was really sure what was going on. Now, in between all of this, he had texted his mom a few times about not feeling well. There was one point in time where he said that he was like uncontrollably vomiting and that he had hit his head and almost went unconscious. And the way that he was explaining it, it seemed like he was repeatedly passing out during this time as well, um, or syncope, and he didn't realize that that was happening, which again was a trend when he would go through these periods of being sick as he would have no clue he was sick. He would have no clue really of what was going on. But the weirdest thing that she put together while thinking about this time was that while he was sick and throwing up and passing out and hitting his head, um, he told her that there was water all over one of his bathrooms. And he couldn't figure out why. He was like, you know, I hit my head. I'm confused. I, I don't know if I passed out. I don't know what's going on. And he said that he had no clue where this water came from. He said maybe it was the neighbor, but there was no signs of a leak upstairs. And so his mom strongly believes that all of these times, specifically this one in particular, could have been an attempt to poison him that was failed, that all of these times someone tried to kill him and he either went and got help and it worked or you know something happened. And interestingly enough, every single time this happened was a time that Cassandra claimed she had spent time with him and she had apparently said she had pizza with him and saw him that Sunday and that Monday he gets a headache and all of a sudden he's found bloody unconscious on the floor of his bedroom days later. Is it possible that the ethylene glycol poisoning wasn't working and so maybe diphenhydramine was tried to get this big man incapacitated to try another way to kill him? When she continued to look through the medical records, she also started putting together the fact that he had these crystals in his urine and remembered when he, she was told that his kidneys were breaking down. But she believes that that's actually calcium oxalate crystals, which is also something that would happen if you were going through antifreeze poisoning. Um, she thinks those may have been the crystals they were actually seeing. Um, and she also started going through different x-rays that were shown. And in one of the x-rays, you can clearly see one of his vertebrae in his neck is out of alignment. Um, it looks like his neck is broken. And so his mom started to wonder, you know, was he not moving because someone broke his neck purposely to paralyze him. If you think about a 300 pound, six foot man, that's a lot to take on unless you manage to incapacitate them. And between the diphenhydramine in his system and a broken neck possibly paralyzing him, at that point, it'd be pretty easy to do whatever the heck you wanna do. And she remembers, you know, he wasn't moving at all. So she brought up this x-ray uh, and said, you know, what is going on with this? I think he has a broken neck. It would make sense if you think about it because the very back of where his head was in that photo, where his head was with the blood, it looks like there's that spray, like someone hit him in the back of the neck and there was just a huge blow and it sprayed blood out. And they quite literally tried to tell her that that was him aspirating. 
despite the fact that in the police files, it says he was laying on his left side, which means his mouth was the other direction. And she looked at the notes when it came to his neck and that being out of alignment. It was said that he possibly had scoliosis of the neck. They literally said he had scoliosis of the neck. And she was like, never have I ever. You know, he probably wouldn't have been able to get into the Navy with something like that. It can be a danger to him. Um, and also she was able to find that in one of his previous hospitalizations, he had x-rays done and there was no curvature at all. So for some reason, the Emmy and everyone looked at this, saw that his neck was broken. His mom also looked at the picture and I haven't looked into this pretty much at all, but you see like these large round dots and it looks like a circle inside of a circle right at where the base of his neck would have been. And she said when she looked this up that this is typical of when your spinal fluid is leaking, like that is what you would see. And so another reason she believes that his neck was broken, but why wasn't that ever put on his uh, death certificate or the autopsy report or anything like that. That was never brought up. He also had the raccoon eyes, which was typical of a skull fracture, but that wasn't really brought up. Also, when you look at his face, which is difficult to do, he was found on his left side, but the blood running down his face almost makes it first of all, looked like he was gagged. His mom strongly believes he was gagged because blood, I mean, the blood isn't a perfect line going down as if something was there directing it back that way. But also to me, that says he was laying on his back for an extended period of time, bleeding heavily from his nose at some point. So at some point he was on his back and then he turned to his side. And then from that point on, he likely was paralyzed because of the blow to the back of his neck. In that and the bruises on the bottom of his feet and the defensive wounds and the blow to his chest. He was left-handed and so many injuries were on his left side. What looks like almost like little like stab wounds, like a screw hit him or a taser or something, the holes in his back. It seems pretty dang clear that this man was tortured for days. Yet somehow these are superficial wounds not related to his death and he died of pneumonia that he tested negative for because he took meth that was never in his system or wait, did he withdraw from alcohol or did he take synthetic marijuana that he didn't have? Like, I just don't understand how people that claimed those things can sleep at night. I really can't. Honestly, this just takes me back to Melissa Platt's case back in 2008, also in North Carolina. Um, and it's it puts like the nastiest pit in my stomach knowing that two separate individuals um, in North Carolina were, you know, showed up and presented with horrible, horrible bruises of varying stages. And, you know, all of these different things, the medical professionals around them said, this person's been beaten, like there was something wrong, this was not self-inflicted. And yet somehow the state of North Carolina collectively agreed on both of them that yes, this was in fact self-inflicted, um, there is no crime here. It's just really, really disturbing to see that. And we all know how I feel about Melissa Platt's case and I worked closely with her sister. Um, so did Kendall Ray. So did Georgia Marie. And as of now, that case has been reopened because enough noise has been made that something was very wrong there. So I'm crossing my fingers that somehow the same thing happens here. Honestly, I agree that I think it's very possible he was gagged, not just from the blood. He also had injuries in his mouth that I spoke about, his tongue, his frenulum, his gums were all bruised as if something had been shoved in his mouth for an extended period of time. Sarah decided to cut contact with Cassandra. She at this point didn't believe that Cassandra was gonna give her any more information. Unfortunately, most of the evidence in the case was destroyed for some reason, uh, no idea why most of the DNA. I know that since her, I know that since Brandon's mom has decided to go through a lot on her own, she has a PI at this point that's going into the case. We have been looking deeply into the truck. So his truck is apparently covered in blood. The sp a spray bottle was found inside of his truck that appeared to have blood on it. And this 
could have been what was used inside of the house to spray things down. The same white substance on the inside of the house was also found in the car. There had been handcuffs found in Brandon's apartment as well, which a lot believe could be why he had damage to his wrists and deep cuts in his wrists. There was a key for handcuffs found in a briefcase in the back of Brandon's car. He had a tarp in his car, which is something that he never would have any reason to use. They found blood and hair on the driver's side of the car, on the passenger side of the car, in the back of the car, underneath the seats, underneath the console. I will put pictures of it. Uh, they have sprayed Blue Star on everything. The truck pretty much lit up everywhere. They have taken their own samples to send off for forensic testing to a nonprofit organization, and they've had to put a lot of money towards doing this. So I know they have a GoFundMe. Some fingerprints. This is the spray bottle in Brandon's vehicle, and I had never looked at it that closely. And then when the luminol was sprayed, this bottle lit up entirely, especially around the bottom. And let's see if I can bring it out in the light. Um, but looking under the cap, And I can only hope there might be some fingerprints on the bottle. I don't want to touch it too much. Um, is there blood there? But this will be bagged and put into evidence. The whole bottle lit up. Everywhere the luminol touched, the bottle was lighting up. So I just like to do the live videos so that it can be a record and the crime scene photo should show this bottle was in the vehicle. Yeah, that's not right. That's...
Sorry if things appear like a little bit different and a drastic cut. My camera died because I had been filming for four hours. So I wanted to quickly kind of go over the stages and symptoms of ethylene glycol poisoning or poisoning from antifreeze. And there's apparently three different stages. And from what I've heard, it's very difficult for it to be found. Um, it says right here on aacc.org, because ethylene glycol poisoning is infrequently encountered in the emergency room setting, detecting it often poses significant challenges to both clinicians and hospital laboratories. Um, I guess in-house testing for ethylene glycol is a substantial undertaking that requires highly trained technical staff and the acquisition of highly specialized instruments. So if someone doesn't know for a fact that's what's happened to them, it can tend to go under the radar. So the first stage typically happens within 30 minutes to 12 hours of ingesting antifreeze. And these symptoms typically include or really attack the central nervous system first. And they appear similar to those of alcohol intoxication. So loss of coordination, slurred or jumbled speech, headache, um, nausea, vomiting, possibly a coma. So that day when he went into work and was super sick. I mean, you're following the same thing there. The second stage happens between 12 and 24 hours. And it says during the stage, your body's trying to metabolize the chemicals because apparently it's not necessarily the ethylene glycol that poisons you. It's the acids that it kind of transforms into. Um, it says these acids lower the pH level of the blood, which leads to a condition called metabolic acidosis, which is another thing that was listed on his medical records. This can cause fatigue, dehydration, changes in blood pressure, confusion. A lot of people lose consciousness at this stage or go into a coma. And then there's the final third stage that usually happens between 24 to 72 hours. And this is where there is a buildup of calcium oxalate crystals, which leads to kidney failure and uh, ultimately death. It's also very interesting because when I was researching antifreeze poisoning and the treatments and things like that, it is stated that usually dialysis is one of the things that is recommended to help resolve the situation, purifying the blood, um, and helping the kidneys get back to working normally. So I think he was possibly on the brink of death that first time that he went to the hospital and the dialysis likely helped him get past that. The first time he went within that first kind of phase of symptoms and like it seemed he went into the second phase of symptoms while he was at the hospital. Um, so he probably caught it just in time. But this time I think it was just too late and so the dialysis couldn't do much because the damage was already done. Um, I honestly hope this investigation is opened back up. Uh, it, it is heartbreaking to look at the Facebook page and see how much work his own family has had to put into solving why he died the way that he did. To me, there's no question that this was something that was done to him. I didn't ever for a minute consider the idea that he had potentially done this to himself. That just seems absolutely asinine that that ever be an option. Brandon's last few days were horrific. And it's very possible someone was in that apartment with him happily watching and then went on to try to have a relationship with his family and looked them in the face knowing something was going on. Hopefully someone is able to help them get some answers. I know that his family's tried to get the FBI involved. They're doing everything they possibly can themselves. Someone just needs to listen. Please support Brandon's family in any way you possibly can. As I stated, there is literally endless information you can go through down below. I spent months looking into this case 
So there might be something in all that information that may help you piece something together. His mom is active in the comments, always speaking to people about what they see, what they might realize, what they may know that she has missed. There's an entire investigation page that his mom is running where they're having conversations about this and putting their minds together to really work on it. So, so I highly encourage you guys to go and check it out. Um, I'm sure their GoFundMe is still accepting donations. If so, I'm going to donate. I just want to double check first and I'll leave the link down to that below. I know they have been using it for the testing, funding the testing. And I know a lot of that testing did come back, but I can only imagine there is more for them to do. On that note, that's all that I have for you guys today. Thank you again for taking the time out of your day to listen to Brandon's story and hopefully actively support his family in getting answers that they so much deserve. It's possible that whoever did this has done this to many other people. So if you're familiar with any other cases similar to this in the North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia area, please, 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 please send them to my email. Um, but that is all that I have for you guys today. Thank you so much again. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Helen fam so we can hopefully bring them home together. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you.